welcome Anchor community and happy Mother's Day. We have a special treat for you this Mother's Day where we have three moms and we're gonna be having a conversation about motherhood, following Jesus, and everything in between. So I'm really excited for it. I think it's gonna be an encouragement to you. But right at the outset, we want to acknowledge that there are a variety of types of moms uh, and a range of experiences with mothers. So there are spiritual moms and mentor moms, adoptive moms and foster moms, biological moms, and probably some other types of moms that we haven't even thought of. And so we know that many of you are one of those types of moms and we want you to be honored. We want you to be encouraged. And then also there's all of us have experiences with our moms. So our hope for you, for all of us tuning in, would be that this would be an encouraging thing for you as we talk about motherhood, following Jesus, and dive deep into the stories and the real life uh, experiences of motherhood and everything in between. So my first question uh, to my friends here is that we're all, you know, you're all type, you're all moms. So share a little bit about your, like who you are as a mom and, and how you're a mom, who you're connected to and, uh, your families. I'm Bonnie Jean Thomas, and um, I get to be on staff here at Anchor, and I'm married to a wonderful guy named Isaac Thomas, and we have uh, four kiddos together. So we have twin kindergartners, and they're, they're six years old, Kiki and Blandon, and then we have a just recently turned five-year-old who wishes he was part of the twin <laughs> pack named Makai. And then um, two years later, so almost three now, um, we have Shay, who is our youngest. So they're kind of quite the party pack. Yeah, of, yeah. Um, they kind of move in a tornado fashion um, through our world and the world of others. So. so life is a little busy, maybe, for you guys? Just full. <laughs> we like the word full. Okay. Yeah, it's Great. a full life, that's for sure. Great. I'm Casey Ennis, and I um, am married to Dakota Ennis. He's our security guy around here. <laughs> um, I have been a mom for just shy of eight months, and it has been quite a remarkable journey. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. Yeah. What's your daughter's name? My daughter's name is Sage. Mm -hmm. yeah. So cute. Yeah. And you are, without beknownst to you, you are a pandemic mother is that what they call them you probably know the terms better but i don't know the terms but that feels fitting yeah the pandemic mom yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it has been a really unique experience to bring a child into this world mm -hmm. um in the state that it is and um i don't think i had anticipated what a difficult thing that would be mm -hmm. with your protective instincts really coming into play mm -hmm. and then this other like shield of of coverage that you want to protect over your family and your daughter with a virus being mm -hmm. you know evident um wasn't nearly as concerned about that until she got here like mm -hmm. it just wasn't as heightened on my radar until she was here and then it just felt like everything changed mm -hmm. and um there was this super protective uh part of me that felt really difficult to turn off. And mm -hmm. so um, I have had to navigate how to move through that in a way that hasn't been um, super depleting to me mm -hmm. and, and to our family and um, find comfort in, in the things that I know that are true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so. I'm Deborah, Deborah White. I'm married to Charles White. And um, my story of becoming a mother is a little different than these two beautiful women sitting next to mm -hmm. me. I was a single mom and um, in the 70s, and I uh, had an amazing daughter named Bianca. I was a single mom with no true support, mm -hmm. not knowing what I was going to do. Um, and I um, as the emotions I'm experiencing now, I brought those emotions, but not smoothed out by Jesus' words. Mm -hmm. And um, but I am briefly just going to read because I don't want to forget them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I had to lean on Jesus to replace fear mm -hmm. with hope, yeah. loneliness with God's presence. Yeah uncertainty with faith, mm -hmm. guilt with knowing God's grace, forgiveness, and un unconditional love for Beautiful. me. 
and the scripture I would go to, there was many scriptures I would go to, yeah. but was um, Psalm 32, 5. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity I have not hid. Mm -hmm. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity mm -hmm. of my sin. Mm -hmm. When I stopped beating myself up as a single mom, yeah. and the guilt and the shame, that's when my life changed yeah. and the Lord made me a new person in him, yeah. a new child of the King. And it made my journey as a mother even more rewarding. Yeah. I, uh, six years after Bianca was born, I yeah. met Charles. Uh, I confessed my sin. The Lord forgave me, brought yeah. me joy. And uh, Charles and I married. It's been 38 years of marriage this year. He adopted Bianca and our family was whole. Mm -hmm. and, and motherhood with an only child has been amazing. Yeah. And especially with Charles by my side, he's an amazing dad. Yeah, yeah. Deborah, that experience that you're feeling just uh, with, you know, that like we all, I think as, as moms, many moms deal with shame. Am I doing enough? Am I doing it? You know, and that's a lot of the journey of wrestling with how can I love? Am I doing it the right way? And there's so much information out there. So I'm, I'm, thanks for sharing your journey, your unique journey, but that one that many of us can still connect with, mm -hmm. you know, um, even if it's not the same exact experience. Right. Um, because we all have a journey of motherhood and Deborah, so thanks so much for sharing. Is there any, uh, any other like of your journey that you would want to share that's like, um, maybe as an encouragement or just to just to pass on to, so people can get to know you guys and your motherhood story. Totally. I got, so Isaac and I got married in 2010. We went to high school together at stadium and went to college, got married when we got home and um, kind of spent our first two years of marriage um, just having fun again to know each other better. And then we started trying to get pregnant. We wanted to start a family in 2012 and kind of quickly realized that, that was gonna be harder for us. And so we um, started with the appointments and the testing and all that kind of stuff. And it was just kind of a, a rough uh, journey for us for a while. We were kind of wondering like, God, hey, we feel like you told us it's go time. And you know, you told your whole life that <laughs> if, when, if you <laughs> wanna have kids, like that's just gonna happen and you yeah. think that's gonna be that way. And it wasn't for us. Yeah. And um, we were kind of at a fork in the road of do we kind of get to more invasive things um, and what do we do? And we kind of decided to jump into a foster care class. And so we did that through DSHS in town. It was super um, helpful right at the start of it. Um, we miscarried. We found out that we miscarried and that was really rough on us. We kind of felt like there was this glimmer of hope and then it went away and that was um, pretty hard for us. We didn't really know what even to do. We, yeah. um, after that appointment, we both just kind of went back to our jobs that day. We just like, feel like we were pretty isolated. We didn't have um, a lot of people walking with us. It was a really yeah. tough um, season for us. Yeah. We finished the adoption class. We were kind of arguing about if we were going to adopt a sibling set or one. And mm. Isaac really thought we should do one kid at a time. And I just felt like we should go for more. And then we found out we were pregnant with twins. So mm -hmm. I was right. I like to remind <laughs> him of that. I knew that the Lord had something different for us. So we got pregnant with the twins and it was kind of a up like a pregnancy that was all over the place a little bit. And we had our gender appointment at 19 weeks. And we found out we were having a boy and a girl and we were like overjoyed. And they pulled us into a small room right after that and let us know that I was going to preterm labor. And wow. so um, we started modified bed rest, which is basically just be horizontal as often as you can. And so it's 13 weeks of that. And then the twins came at 33 weeks in an emergency C-section, kind of through the scrubs at Isaac and we ran and um, they spent two weeks in the NICU and um, it was super scary and a really interesting way to start motherhood. We also had the most amazing uh, like nurse mamas with the kiddos and mm -hmm. um, they came home like kind of sleep trained, which was actually nice. So <laughs> now that I've had real newborns, I'm even more thankful for that experience after yeah. that. Um, then we, a couple months later, found out we were pregnant with Makai. So yeah. he was kind of a, a surprise a couple months later and we were shocked that my body just kind of <laughs> kicked in with um, a lack of help, which was crazy. And then, 
Um, we just didn't feel like our family was, we were done yet and um, got pregnant again about two years later and ended up having a miscarriage again. And that was really devastating. It kind of, you feel like you're past that season and you re-enter into it. Um, so that was that time. Fortunately, we had friends yeah. and a community around us and we um, had done some counseling and things like that. So we had some tools. Um, yeah. It was just really helpful. And then we got pregnant with Shay and she's our yeah. whirlwind child. Yeah, she's... If you know Shay, you know Shay, <laughs> um, but she's been awesome. Um, in that we've, we journey, we left our teaching jobs and went on ministry staff and lots of stuff that just made it so we were able to be really present and flexible with the kids' schedules. And that's kind of what life's been is present and flexible yeah. <laughs> ever since yeah. then. So Great. it's been quite the journey. Mm -hmm. Casey, you mentioned a little bit about your journey. Um, mm -hmm. Having a child in this last year, um, Anything you'd add to that? No pressure too, but anything you'd add to that? Uh, you talked a little bit about, you know, some of those, that heightened sense of mm -hmm. protection, you know, that comes there, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, it was, it was really difficult to navigate, to yeah. be transparent. I think there's, there's still even this um, element of emotion that my body carries talking about it yeah. Yeah. Um, because it felt so significant probably yeah. one of the most significant things i've ever experienced yeah. and um i felt so underprepared yeah. in knowing how to navigate what that looked like and there was this element of i think that there was this internal dialogue of of shame that i was feeling because yeah. i was on one hand i was so overjoyed to bring this precious beautiful remarkable human into yeah. the world. And on the other hand, I was struggling so deeply with fear and anxiety and um, this uncertainty that I couldn't put my hands around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so we wanted to invite people into our life. We wanted to have family to, co to come over yeah. and you know wrap their arms around us and be able to hold sage. Um, but every fiber of my being felt like that could be a potential threat. Yeah. And so, um, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, I think I was about, I don't know, 10, seven or 10 days postpartum, really yeah. exhausted, not sleeping because of the fatigue, yeah. um, fearing that something might happen to her, um, which is a normative experience for a lot of women postpartum. Yet I felt like I, this shouldn't be happening to me. What is inherently wrong with me? Why is this journey yeah. not this beautiful, remarkable experience that I see on Instagram and yeah. social media? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, right around that time, I really had to uh, call on people for help yeah. mm -hmm. and, and open up my doors and be willing to accept the help that we so desperately needed. Yeah. And so um, there were a lot of nights of just... Uh, praying like mm. god take this away mm -hmm. why yeah. yeah yeah casey i know this even you sharing there you know not many other people know but you're, you're a counselor you've worked in counseling for mm -hmm. years you've worked uh counseling those struggling with houselessness right and now you have your own practice and so just even hearing you wrestle with it i think it might be helpful for people to know that you're not um you're you have training in providing care for people and helping people navigate through very tricky situations. Mm -hmm. But here in this last year, you know, with your faith to draw on, even with uh, with a community to draw on, you know, with your training, even it's still hard, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's important, I think, you know, for people watching to know that, that mm -hmm. like, here's a person with many resources and still very hard. Yeah. So um, hopefully that's maybe an encouragement for some of us that are watching that's yeah. real, right? Yeah. It absolutely is. Yeah. Casey, thank you for opening that season of your life up to us and, and just being able, I think that's helpful. Um, so one of my favorite terms for this last year, you know, uh, there's lots of ways we could describe this last year. We could, my favorite term is goat rodeo. It kind of feels like a goat rodeo. So, uh, so uh, Bonnie Jean, you know, you've had these yeah. four kiddos mm. at home, you know, and uh, how have you done it? I mean, I think for, for a lot of times it affects dads and moms, of course, mm -hmm. affects, mm -hmm. but for a, a lot of times some of the pressure and weight falls more on moms, mm -hmm. not, not always, but mm -hmm. more on moms than dads that, you know, whereas we're 
principal and teacher, mm-hmm. right? And mom and, mm-hmm. you know, lunch lady or lunch, lunch dad, you know, man mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, so how have you managed this goat roadie of all the last yeah, year? Yeah, totally. Um, so when the stay at home, when we started to hear about the stay at home order, I did what any rational person would do. And I got on Airbnb and tried to figure <laughs> out how I was going to get to Hawaii on cheap flights. Um, but but in, in in the motherhood part of that, I was imagining what it was going to be like. I'm, I'm the mom that Saturday morning, it was pre-pandemic, we were yeah. in the car by 9 a.m. And we, we drive to Olympia for coffee often just because... Our kids are strapped in and there's a TV in our van. And so Isaac and I get to have a little bit of a Saturday morning connection date. And um, that was kind of part of our routine. We just didn't lock ourselves in the house. And so when we heard that was coming, like that is the Airbnb is a a fun adventure, but it was also like a place of desperation. And so we didn't end up flying to Hawaii, um, not from a lack of trying. And um, (laughs) we ended up driving to Oregon to the middle of nowhere to this house that had an indoor pool. And that was super Mm -hmm. fun for us because we just needed that. And it actually was a super sweet escape for our family. And then we came back and it, we just settled in. It was actually super sweet. My husband and I are both um, working for a little bit and then he got sent home from work. Their um, offices shut down. I was working from home. And so we really tag teamed. Um, I don't really feel like it was more on me and it was probably actually more on him, which is pretty unique. Um, I was taking some grad school classes and working and then um, I kind of began a medical journey. So I uh, found a lump in my neck um, in March. You know, I was texting some friends because we're all alone at home. And I'm like, what do you think this is? And they were like, oh, maybe allergies, you know, and so waited and um, started to kind of get a little bit more suspicious about stuff. And um, over the course of the next like two and a half months, we did some biopsy and things like that. And I found out that I had Hodgkin's lymphoma and it was super scary in the middle of a pandemic and it just felt compounded. And um, I had like a deep sense from the beginning. And even if you Google Hodgkin's lymphoma and the kind that I had, um, the like statistics are really in my favor, but I was just super worried about my kids. Yeah. I just feel like, um, I didn't want this to be a part of their story. And I, um, wasn't sure what they were going to witness in my struggle. And so I was super like, that was like the, yeah. where the anxiety and where the yeah. stress and the, um, worry really manifested for me. Um, but then at the same time, it was so nice that we could say that I was sick and not even give them a name for it. So they weren't yeah. at school on the playground using words like cancer and then having other people react and, you know, you can't yeah. trust a yeah. kindergartner or tell a kindergartner or anything um, yeah. helpful. And so we had this sweet protection yeah. and um, space and I started chemo and um, we were, you know, commuting up to Seattle and doing all that stuff. So our, like the bulk of our pandemic part was, uh, I was sick in bed a ton, um, and we just kind of like our, my bedroom's on the main floor, and it was actually kind of sweet because I could just leave the door open and feel really connected with the family still, but still be resting. Yeah. Um, but that was kind of the main, yeah. the main bulk of what kind of that looked like. Just what you mentioned there again, it's you you are experiencing something traumatic, mm-hmm. but your thought instantly goes, "How can I shield my kids?" Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is uh, it's 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 indicative of of parenthood, mm-hmm. but but in some ways it feels like a, a motherhood a motherhood instinct, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so thanks, Bonnie Jean, for opening yeah. that part of your story up to us and just this uh, really a vulnerable piece of this last year. Mm-hmm. Deborah, maybe uh, just to include you into this, you know, like you're a grandma, right? And part of the journey for this last year is not being able to see those kiddos Mm -hmm. did not have that access now they live i mean i know from knowing you i know they live in a different state but but still just knowing that couldn't be a a a flight away you know is that something was that did that play into it or was that not much of an issue or oh no it was a huge issue um one i wanted to make sure that plenty of us hand wipe sanitizers were being used before they stuck their fingers in their mouth to (laughs) suck their thumbs but if I didn't know the Lord yeah. and know that every day I could just say, Jesus, put yeah. your hand on them yeah. and protect them, um, it would have been very, very difficult for yeah. me. But it, it, you know, I went through from a distance kind of the same motherhood yeah. issues of making sure they were okay, not having them around certain yeah. people, you know, being careful in crowds and all this, of course, via 
text to my daughter. I yeah. think she kind of got maybe a little sick of that. <laughs> but, you know, like, I know how to be a mom, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, it was, it was hard. And, yeah. but like I said, if I didn't know the Lord to just trust in him and say, okay, I'm going to worry about it for a minute. Yeah. And then I'm just going to say, Lord, they're in your hands. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Which is a great trans- transition. Cause like this, this year has been crazy, you know, for all, for all of us, for all people. Um, you know, you two have shared some like some some real stuff, real life stuff that you've been wrestling with. Mm-hmm. I'm interested, and in, Deborah, you kind of touched on this. Like, how did we? How did you meet the Lord? Mm-hmm. How did? What did it look like for your faith to become real in this last season? We're we're dealing with real stuff, but how did the Lord meet you in the middle of that real stuff? You know, for me, I. I think that's what I struggled with early on was this this hope and this understanding that it would somehow just go away, right? This anxiety yeah. would just relieve me. And I felt really discouraged in that, you know, what what am I doing wrong? Yeah. What, where did I go wrong? Am I being punished, right? Yeah. Those thoughts that haven't crossed my mind since I was probably a youth. Yeah. And, um, and then day after day, t- day after day went by. And um, when I actually ended up, I actually ended up um, having a clot that I had to go to the hospital for. Yeah. And when I went into the hospital and I spent time with the nurses there, that was where I felt like God met me. Mm-hmm. And um, gosh, yeah. <clears throat> if I, <clears throat> Yeah, sitting in that hospital bed and um, mm-hmm. recognizing the the limits of yeah. my humanity, yeah. and um, being met with um, such compassionate nurses yeah. um, gave me a level of comfort that I so desperately needed yeah. at that time. And yeah. um, I'll never forget this nurse that came in, um, and uh, she sat with me and. Um, was just kind of talking me through my test results, letting me know things were going to be okay, you're doing great. And I told her that I was just really struggling with this anxiety. And that was the first time I had spoken up about it wow. because I had felt so much shame. Like, I'm a mental health counselor. Like, I should reason my way out of this. Yeah. I'm like, what is going on? Right. Um, I'm having a trauma response. I need to get connected in my brain. Like, using all of these yeah. things mm-hmm. that I that I work with clients with, but yet I wasn't able to get myself out of. And I remember her sitting with me and um, asking if she could pray with me. Yeah, wow. And um, she sat and prayed over me wow. and took the next step and wrote, God is love on my board. Oh. Oh. And so when I would wake up in the middle of the night panicked and I would yeah. turn over to Sage to make sure she was breathing, I'd read that. Yeah. And it gave me such comfort. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I feel like that image of that board yeah. I've carried with me in yeah, my good. days at home of seeing God as love. That's good. Um, and so it wasn't necessarily through um, feeling like God was wrapping his arms around me or feeling like I heard his voice, but it was through his people yeah. mm-hmm. that I felt his love so deeply yeah. um, that gave me this comfort that has carried me through this journey. Yeah. Um, and so as as this anxiety has lifted and as I felt more of my footing, yeah. I'm able to to look back and see the ways that he yeah. had perfectly placed people into my life yeah. that I couldn't necessarily see in that moment, but I look back and yeah. I see the significance and I'm so thankful for it. Yeah. It just as an encouragement, I mean, I think that the, the fact that a person uh, of faith, a Jesus follower, met, like asked permission mm-hmm. in an area where it's not like they, that's their normal practice, but they asked permission, you gave permission. And, and I think for many of us as Jesus followers, sometimes we're not in an area where we typically will pray for someone or ask that, but sometimes we just need to respond to that tap on the shoulder and, mm-hmm. and ask permission and, and step into that moment And because that was transformative for you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Bonnie Jean, how, how's the Lord met you in this yeah. year? I think in like the two images that come to mind when I think like and I've walked through adversity in my life is either the Lord really covering me and kind of creating a shelter or um, giving me like a wide open space. And that's what I really felt like in this, whether it was like the wide open space of the pandemic and that we kind of had additional excuses and boundaries to just hold up as a family. Um, or um, even just kind of my what my recovery journey has entailed and going back to work and things like that. But um, Psalm 119.45, 
was something that my um, a really good friend and mentor of mine sent to me. And it said, um, I'll stride freely through wide open spaces as I look for your truth and your wisdom. Then I'll tell the world what I find. And that was just so, um, it was so helpful and healing to me. Um, it felt like he was giving me the space that I needed um, to journey. And it wasn't going to be one where I was going to be covered and protected and kind of in hiding. But at the same time, um, it's been really cool to tell the world what I've found and yeah. the way that the Lord's met me and just to share, even though maybe my natural instincts are to kind of keep things really um, close to the chest. And so um, to share our journey from the beginning, um, and we did because of some pandemic, a lot of that was via social media. Yeah. Um, and it was it was hard to bring people in and it kind of, you know, vulnerability is giving people the ability to um, to do something like react to what you're saying. And so it felt really vulnerable and it felt vulnerable to the kids and my family. But um, I just, the way that the Lord's met me and I think the most healing stuff has been, um, hey, when you shared this, you know, I, I got to walk with a woman that um, found out she was pregnant and then days later found out she had leukemia oh. and she recently had her daughter and she's healthy. And that's been, that was amazing. But that was through a social media connection. And it sounds, you know, it sounds so small, but for me, those moments, I got reconnected with some former students of mine. I was mm -hmm. a teacher, you know, for five years and that are going through some stuff. It was just as incredible the way that the Lord used my one step forward yeah. to mm -hmm. connect with people that were really in isolation and yeah. what it, what that kind of looked like. So even like as the world was shutting down, I felt the Lord kind of didn't let me shut down in the midst of yeah. what was going on and really um, gave me a purpose in the middle yeah. of those things. So you had a friend, a close mentor, share a verse with you that became a touchstone for, for God to kind of minister and encourage you. And then also you sharing your story mm -hmm. with others became an encouragement to other people. Mm -hmm. So there's there's kind of these cool two elements of really just somebody leaning out mm -hmm. and offering something to the mm -hmm. other person mm -hmm. and God meeting in that place. Yeah. That's and just great. really, I feel like I had the space to to meet God in a minute by minute in yeah. a lot of ways. And um you know, when, when we're weak, he gets to be strong for us. And so um, I don't think you know what that feels like until you feel like you need God mm -hmm. minute yeah, by minute. Absolutely. And motherhood for sure did that to me in so many different ways. Um, and compounded with this last year, it's been, um, I like won't walk out of this experience the same person at all That's because great. of the way that he's met me in all those ways. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Deborah, I'm interested, you know, how has becoming a mom caused you to understand and have compassion on your own mom? Mm. Think back. Kleenex time. <laughs> okay. Uh, my mother's and my journey were pretty much the same. Yeah. Um, she was a single mom. She got pregnant in the 50s. Um, I was a single mom, was pregnant in the 70s. The difference was she didn't know Jesus. Yeah. I knew Jesus, but I wasn't really obviously following Jesus. And to be an unwed mother in the 50s, mm. very difficult. Yeah. Shame, people, you know, when she'd walk by or even people in the family would talk behind, whisper in each other's ears about yeah. her, you know, what kind of woman she was. And um, I know it had to be very, very difficult um, she entered the hospital with no one with her when she was ready to deliver. Wow. No husband to wave goodbye and say it's all going to be okay. Yeah. No husband to be in the delivery room to pass out cigars, <laughs> you know, once I was born. You used to be able to do that. I know. <laughs> well, don't they do like fake gum ones, you yeah. know? Um, <laughs> Not the same. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I just... You know, I, I just think about this. And when I really started thinking about everything she went through is when she lived with us and we took care of her. She had dementia mm. and died from it wow. in our home, in her bed with us holding, both Charles and I holding yeah. her. And through the caring of her, yeah. I thought a lot about our relationship because it was completely different. Yeah. I was caring for her. She no longer was the mother caring yeah. for me. Yeah. And I had to forget all the stuff that I'd gone through, you know, emotional stuff with her and just ask the Lord to heal yeah. this relationship, you know? 
And I, um, as I'm thinking this, all she went through to have me, that she really did love me yeah. because she could have easily not had me, you know, in many ways. And um, for me, when I became pregnant, yeah. I knew mm -hmm. because my mom loved me, yeah. I knew that I had to have this child, even yeah. though people from all walks of life, from my church, from non-church members, friends, that it would be the wrong thing for me to wow. do. And having Bianca was my life saving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was my life saving baby. Yeah. My life changed dramatically. I um I knew what not to do because of my relationship with my mother. Yeah. And I knew what to do. Yeah. You know, I was kind of like, I think, and I still am, um, like the mother smother on hmm. the Goldbergs to say <laughs> <laughs> You know, and guess what? She's like that with hers. <laughs> and I just, you know, even now as an adult, I, I still want to be a part of that. Yeah. You know, but I realize sometimes, I, I mean, I felt ignored or not needed, but that was the time I had to let her go. Mm -hmm. She's a mom. She's married. Yeah. You know, she has two amazing kids and she's doing really good at what she does and yeah. she doesn't always need me yeah. there and i needed to learn to let go and not yeah. be yeah. a mother's smother which yeah. ties into that next the next question i want to ask you know is that it's difficult like to see your kids start to grow up right because you love them and you love them at this stage and all of a sudden they're leaving the stage yeah. and they're still going to be your kids but they're the stage you've you've affected you're, you've connected with they're leaving that stage and it becomes hard, as you've just mentioned, Deborah. <clears throat> so I'm interested, you know, how, how have you dealt with that journey of, 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 of kind of like watching your kids grow up? Casey, yours, yours is still pretty little, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and even Buddy Jean, yours are, you, yours mm -hmm. are young, you know, but still there's mm -hmm. stages, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if you could share any insight of, of what it's looked like to kind of like watch some things grow and develop and how that's been beautiful and hard you shared a really appalling video of a seventh month a seven month old walking yes. this week and when i say appalling i just the, the mother in me was like push her over <laughs> don't let that happen like you can control that milestone <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was definitely startling i you know i don't know that i have felt the angst of like don't grow up. Yeah. Um, for me at this point, it's been really exciting and it's been a journey that I just feel like I'm excited for the next milestone. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but when I look back on pictures, when my husband and I will like look back when we first brought her home, mm -hmm. I think that's when I'm like, wait, how did you get from here to here? Like you weren't even opening your eyes. And for me, that's the, there's a lot of rich beauty in that because yeah. I think about just when she first opened her eyes, how that felt like a milestone. Mm -hmm. And then when she could wrap her fingers around my, uh, around my hand, that felt like a milestone. Um, and so I think I've appreciated the growth spurts. Like, talk to me when she's walking, but... Um, <laughs> or talking. I know, right? Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's more of something that I, I, I think at this point I'm, I look forward to. I don't have yeah. angst about, but... Um, I don't know. I, I've really appreciated it. It's, mm -hmm. it's been a fun journey. So, yeah, but I could probably awesome. learn, from, learn from your experience yeah, about where yeah, they're at now. Yeah. yeah. Well, at one point we had three in diapers, and I think oh. we were actually really excited for that milestone. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> so I feel like there's been there's been times we've mourned. I think even in the pandemic, yeah. it's been kind of hard to like show our kids to people that haven't seen them in a while and to be like, whoa, you know, and they're, yeah. you know, shocked yeah. or the first time I, my, it would been a couple months and my best friend and I have been super close for years and she found out she was pregnant right before the pandemic started and she came to my door after I got diagnosed and brought me a gift and her stomach popped out and I lost it. Like, mm. oh, that was like such a hard, like those are the milestones. I feel yeah. like the ones that we feel like we're missing sometimes, they, ca they catch us off guard. So yeah. her... That was like one of the ones that act like around motherhood that really stands out to me. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think that you, I love watching the kids grow. I love them creating their bonding things, but there's there's nothing like um, wearing a baby for me. Yeah. Like I last night I did something that I really love to do and I came home and was telling Isaac all about it. And I said, you know what would have made it a little better? 
if I had a baby on me, because <laughs> that just feels like the sprinkle yeah. on top sometimes for in my world, I feel like it's like the rock and roll. So mm. there's when they stop letting me like wear them, that's always been like pretty crushing for me. One of the, the gifts, one of the gifts of technology is that we get these mm -hmm. memories, mm -hmm. right? And so um, whether it's whatever social media platform is, you know, these memories show up. And for me, I'm like, that, that was two years ago. So much has changed. Mm -hmm. And one mm -hmm. thing that I've tried to discipline myself to do is to both grieve and celebrate mm -hmm. every stage, mm -hmm. right? It could be relating to parenthood mm -hmm. or, or anything else. And I think usually we transition well through stages when we make a discipline of grieving and celebrating, mm -hmm. right? Um, I know that's something that's been helpful for me. Okay, the last question I have for you guys is if you could meet yourself right before you became a mom, what is something you'd say? I think I would probably say it's okay to ask for help. It's mm -hmm. good. Um, and it's okay that you can't do everything yeah. right off the bat that you'd hope you do. Yeah. Um, because as many women know, the postpartum period is a period of recovery. Yeah. And um, I had come home from the hospital and I think I was still running on adrenaline, felt great through clothes in the laundry, mm -hmm. like I cooked my meals. My husband was like, you should probably sit down. I'm like, no, I'm good, I'm good. Um, and then by day four, I was like, I'm not good, I'm not good. Um, and so recognizing that it's okay to receive help, that it's okay to reach out, it's okay yeah. to express your limits. Um, and, and that ultimately, like God is covering you. Yeah. God's protection is, um, is so big and so wide yeah. and it's so difficult to grasp, but like he has got you. Yeah. And um, I think becoming a mother was one of the first times that was really, really challenged mm -hmm. because that was the point where I became responsible for something mm -hmm. that I would give my life for yeah. and that I would do anything for. And that really challenged my theology in some ways yeah. of like, wait, but I'm supposed to put the oxygen mask on myself first mm. before my kid. Like yeah. I tell people this all the time in therapy, yeah. but like, no, I can't do this. Yeah. Right. Where that was really challenged. Um, and so really growing to trust God and receive help from others, yeah. um, I think is something that I, I wish I would have been more open to. And I'm, I'm hoping that somebody else can be encouraged by that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Casey. Mm. Well, Knowing I was going to be a single mom, mm -hmm. four words, Jesus, take the wheel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, totally. In all truthfulness, right? <laughs> In all truthfulness. <laughs> yeah. I had to depend on him yeah. to steer me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Deborah. Mm -hmm. Bye, Jean. How about you? Yeah, I, I remember sitting with a mentor at Starbucks right after I had Mackay. So I have two one-year-olds at home and... Um, a newborn and her kind of looking at me and being like, you don't have to do it the way you're doing it. And I, I kind of, I left that meeting and was like, this is how I want to do it. And it'd been the plan. It was how I always envisioned it was going to look. And I, she was kind of hinting that, you know, you could yeah. reduce your, you could go from part-time or go down to part-time. I was working full-time at that point. And, and I like wanted to stick to the plan. I think I would look back at, um, cause that's when it hit. That's when it, like, that's when my really big challenge is the twins. It was, I feel like you just expect to be underwater. But when, when I had one baby, I, you know, maybe a little too confident that I'd done this before. So this is gonna be half the work. And he was not half the work. <laughs> um, and I think that that's what I would like, that the plan can change yeah, and that open handedness yep. and that. Mm -hmm. The second that I look at God, I'm like, how do you want me to do this? Yep. You know, when some when a curveball comes, whether it's good or bad, looking yep. to him and being like, how's this supposed to look? And I had to ask for help. And I had to ask my husband, like, you can't teach yep. like this is teaching is such a schedule where there's no flexibility. And I just said, I need more access to you because I really my partner, like I could have done it without him. And mm -hmm. he's incredible. But it's um, it didn't he didn't just pivot. He pivoted out of desperation on my part. Wow. And so being able to the Lord to press me to ask and um, those things like, and it's been super cool to watch the Lord um, show us what parenthood was going to look like for us. Because mm -hmm. when you look left and right, 
Um, I think that there's, it feels like it from a mom that there's a right way to do it and then there's a wrong way. And I felt like I might be doing it wrong because it looks so different. And so for the Lord to just paint a clear picture in our family of what, how he was going to have, how this was going to look and what we needed to do. And it required a ton of open handedness. And yeah. so just, I think like loosening my grip from the beginning and kind of like the plan can change. Yeah. yeah. Chill out. Maybe yeah. that would have been good. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. great. That's great. Well, I'm so thankful for all of your stories and your contributions. I know that it has encouraged many, um, whatever their relationship to motherhood, if they are just somebody who has a mom mm -hmm. or if they are a, bio mom themselves or a foster mom, adoptive mom, spiritual mom, mentor mom, any other type of mom. I know that everyone has been encouraged by your stories, your words, your insight. And I'm reflecting on um, Matthew chapter 23 right now. Yeah. And Jesus is looking at Jerusalem and he says, how long have I desired, have I wanted to put you under my wings like a mother hen would, you know? And so for me, it's striking that Jesus God in the flesh wants to communicate his love. And the, the best metaphor is motherhood. Mm -hmm. The best metaphor he can give is motherhood. You know, this protective enclosure, like come under me, come under my wings. And Bible teachers will say that it's a, the mother hen will do that when, when, there's an, when there's somebody coming to attack. You know, so the response of the mother hen is to bring the, the wing and to protect and shield. And, and she takes the blows, mm -hmm. which is often what motherhood feels like. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to know that that's our God's response mm -hmm. when he looks at us, mm -hmm. even if we're wayward or if we're following, he desires to express his love of which the best metaphor sometimes is motherhood. Mm -hmm. And on the cross, he did this beautiful, he, he took the blows mm -hmm. and brought us under his wing at his own expense mm -hmm. to give us his love. And so as we close, um, my hope for you um, is that you're aware of this love uh, of God uh, that is expressed as parental love. And Jesus there in Matthew 23 uses the image of, of a mother hen to give the picture of what love looks like. We're gonna step now into a call and response prayer. And I believe uh, as you participate in at your home, you'll be encouraged and brought into uh, this collective call and response prayer and be sent out to go follow Jesus this next week in the world.